seated. Let's pray together today. Father, this morning we come to you as needy people. Lord, all of us need deliverance. Where would we be today without Jesus? Thank you that Jesus has come and broken our chains. Thank you that he's freed us from guilt and condemnation, from the power of sin. Thank you for the freedom that we can experience from the presence of sin in our lives. So help us to realize that in you, all of your promises are true. In Jesus, we can become who you desire for us to be, who you've always intended for us to be. So Lord, I pray that you would help us individually, corporately as a congregation. Help us to put our trust in you. And as we do, Lord, I pray that you would help us to experience the victory. I pray for those in our midst today that are struggling. I know we have families that are struggling with illness and disease. Lord, I know that we have marriages that are struggling. We have families that are struggling, families that are split and divided. We have parents who are here today who are broken for their kids. Father, we have people here today that have physical needs, financial needs. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would meet us right where we are. Help us to sense your presence. Help us to sense your power in our lives. And, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and mold us and shape us into who you want us to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I was in high school, I ran track. I was on the track team. I know you, you might look at me today and, uh, and say, boy, he doesn't really have a track body. Um, uh, you have to remember, that was like 40 years ago, all right? So I was a little bit thinner than I am right now. And the main event that I ran when I was on the track team was the 440 relay, all right? I wasn't fast enough to be like the 100-yard dash guy, but I ran the 440 relay. And here's what the 440 relay consisted of. It consisted of four guys, or if you were on the, the girls' team, it, four girls, and each of them ran 110 yards. Today, things are mostly in meters, and so it's the 4 by 100 relay. And so we each ran that relay. And so what happened? I can't remember if I was the second or the third leg. And so the first guy would take off. All of them would take off at the second time, and he would run 110 yards, or he would run 100 meters. And as he approached that second runner, he would then have a baton similar to this, and he would pass the baton on to the next runner. The next runner would take that baton and take off and run 100 meters or 110 yards. And as he or she approached the next runner, they would pass pass the baton to the third runner, and the third runner would grab it and take off and so on until all four runners had, had crossed the finish line. And so the goal was for your four guys to be faster than the four guys on the other teams. And, and I must say that our team was really fast, and we won a lot. And so if anybody wants to be on the Hollywood Community Church 440 relay team, I need three more guys, and we're ready to go. So... I'm actually joking. I'm not sure I could run 100 yards right now. I'm not sure. Two keys in order to win a 440 relay. You needed four guys who ran really fast, and you needed to smoothly and successfully pass the baton. You see, you could have the four fastest runners on the track, but if you did not successfully pass the baton, you were disqualified. As a matter of fact, if you drop the baton, at that moment, your team was disqualified. It wasn't like you'd go back and pick up the baton and keep running. If you drop the baton, your team was disqualified. So, so, so today I want to uh, segue from the racetrack to the track of life. 
Because the simple truth is this, just as a runner in the 440 relay and other relays had the responsibility to pass the baton from one runner to the other in order to be successful, so we as believers have the responsibility to pass the baton of our faith on to the next generation. Does that make sense today? So, so all of us have a spiritual baton in our hands today. And all of us have the responsibility to pass that baton on to the runners who come behind us. The book of Judges tells us the story of a generation, a, a successful generation, who failed to do that. So I want to begin today in Judges chapter 2. If you take your Bibles with me and turn to Judges chapter 2. Uh-oh, we dropped the baton. What happens? <laughs> Judges chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. Let me read it, and then we'll set the context. Judges chapter 2 and verse 7. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Let me put this in context. So Joshua was the leader who uh, followed Moses. Joshua was the leader who uh, um, led the people from the border of the desert right into the promised land. Joshua was the leader who helped them conquer the city of Jericho and, and those great victories that are found in the book of Joshua. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. So here is this generation, the, this incredibly successful generation who experienced the mighty power of God. And that generation began to die. Verse 8, and says, and Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died in an age of 110 years. Verse 9, and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnath Ares, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. Here's the verse I want you to see. Notice verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Let me once again put this in context. So Joshua's generation was most likely the strongest, the bravest, and the most successful generation in the history of Israel. The book of Joshua, without a doubt, is probably the most exciting, the most victorious book in the Old Testament. Most compare the book of Joshua in the Old Testament to the book of Acts in the New Testament. Because in the book of Joshua, you see the mighty hand of God. You see what God can do through a people who believe in Him and trust Him and make themselves available for God to use them. Joshua's generation was incredibly successful. They experienced and saw the mighty hand of God. Just so you know, for context, only 71 years had passed. From, from the writing of this book, 71 years back, only 71 years had passed since they had escaped from the land of Egypt. They had, they had seen with their own eyes the destruction of the Egyptians. They, they experienced miracles in the desert. Can you imagine what it was like to wake up every morning and not have to prepare breakfast? All you had to do was wake up, stretch, and walk outside your door, and there was manna right outside. And all you had to do was scoop it up and go inside and eat. God prepared. God gave them food every single morning for years and for decades, they experienced that. They crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. They saw God part the waters, and they crossed the Jordan River. They conquered the city of Jericho. You know the story. They walked around it seven days, and on the seventh day, they walked around it seven times and shouted, and God made the walls fall flat. They experienced all of those miracles. What a successful and miraculous history 
to pass on to your children. I read that and I think surely, surely they would tell their kids. Surely they would share with their grandkids all of the great things that God had done, how God had rescued them, how God had fought for them, how God had guided them, and how God provided for them. And yet Judges tells us that when that generation died, there arose another generation after them who didn't know the Lord, nor did they know the works that God had done for Israel. Here's what I want you to catch this morning. I believe that there is nothing more tragic, there is nothing more tragic than one generation of believers not passing on their faith to the next generation. Did you catch that today? There is nothing more tragic than one generation of believers who have experienced the power of God, who know what it means to live by faith, who have seen God work in their lives, and yet they do not pass on that faith, those experiences, that passion to serve Jesus to the next generation. Today we begin a new series that we simply have titled Hashtag Family Goals. Our, our goal very simply is to help you, to help our, our parents and our, our grandparents and our future parents, to help you as a church to point your kids to Jesus. You might be sitting here today and say, Brian, man, I... I don't have kids yet. Well, Lord willing, one day you will have kids. Or maybe you're here today and you say, Brian, man, all of my kids are grown and they're not in the house anymore. That might be true, but you still have incredible influence over the lives of your children. And by the way, your responsibility as a parent never stops, whether they're in your house or whether they're out of your house, whether you're paying their bills or whether you're not paying their bills. So it doesn't matter where you are today in your family life, all of us have been commissioned. All of us have been given this unbelievable responsibility by God to point our families, our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids, wherever you are in the spectrum, to point them to Jesus. So, so here's the main idea of our sermon series that we're going to be fleshing out during the month of February. The main idea is this. As parents, as parents, our most important responsibility is to help our children become passionate disciples of Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? We're going to say that over and over and over in our series. As parents, our most important responsibility is to help our kids become passionate disciples of Jesus Christ. As parents, we have a lot of responsibilities, do we not? We have to provide a roof over the heads of our kids. We, we want to we wanna make sure that they have food to eat. We want to make sure that, that they get a good education. We want to make sure that they experience all the things that, that this life offers for them. And as parents, I hear this all the time from parents, at the end of the day, we want our kids to be better off, to have a better life than, than we have had, right? As parents, that's what we strive to do. I mean, we want our kids to maybe have a better education, to, better be, be a, to have a better career, to maybe be more successful, to have all of their needs met, and maybe even their wants met as well. And we want them to experience everything Thing that this life offers them. But I'm afraid, church, I'm afraid that as born-again believers, we've lost our way. And I'm afraid that we as believers have been more concerned with making sure that our kids are a success in this life than we are to make sure that they're prepared for the next life. Someone has said this, we're not losing our kids. They're already gone. And we have lost a generation 
of believers. I know I'm speaking to people in our congregation whose heart is broken for your kids. And you would love nothing more than your children who have walked away from God to once again have a love and a passion for Jesus Christ. And I know today I'm speaking to parents of little kids that are sitting back saying, Brian, okay, how do we, our kids are young, how do we teach them, train them, uh, bring them up in a way that they love Jesus with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all of their might? I get that. During this series, we want to answer of the following questions. We want to answer a lot of questions. How can you tell your child about Jesus? How can you share the gospel in a way that your son or your daughter understands the truth of the gospel? How can you make sure that your children become passionate disciples of Jesus Christ? Not just church attenders, but passionate disciples of Jesus. How can you make sure your kids don't lose their faith? How can you make sure that your kids don't abandon church, abandon their faith, and walk away from Jesus when they get older? But those are tremendous questions. And those are tremendous questions to which the Bible has answers. So we want to be extremely practical in this series. So we're not only going to look at biblical principles in this series, but we want to give you tools. We want to give you ideas. We want to help you. Uh, whatever phase of life your family is at, we want to help you point your kids and your grandkids to Jesus. Here's what we desire. We desire for your family to have a spiritual legacy generation after generation who are faithful followers of the Lord. So during the next couple of weeks today, we're going to be looking at the importance of passing it on. Next week, Pastor Jose is going to be talking about the importance of putting Jesus first in your life. What that means, what, what does that look like in a 21st century family to put Jesus first? We want to be talking about how to share the gospel with your children. Uh, I'm surprised the times that we have even believers who have grown up in the church that, that aren't sure how to tell their kids about Jesus. And so we want to do it in a very practical way so that you know how to take God's word and share the gospel with your kids. And then, and then what is that process of as your kids grow up to helping them become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Not only just in the early years, but even in the, in the middle school years, and then in the high school years, and then when they graduate from high school and they go off to college. How, how, can, how can you help your children become passionate disciples of Jesus? That's what we're going to look at during the month of February. So if you have your outlines in front of you, we begin with a very simple point. The very simple point is a very powerful point. And the first truth is this, helping your kids become disciples of Jesus begins with you. <laughs> Let me say that again. Helping your kids become disciples of Jesus begins with you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your little finger and point it back at yourself and say this, it begins with me. Would you do that with me today? It begins with me. That's where it begins. It doesn't begin with choosing the right church. It doesn't begin with, with, with finding a church who has the most dynamic children's ministry or has the greatest youth pastor. All of those things are important. But, but making sure that your kids become disciples of Jesus Christ begins with you. Mom and dad, that is where it starts. That is where it begins. To take your Bibles with me and go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You see, Joshua's generation had already been given instructions by God. And God had already told them how they could avoid the tragedy that takes place in the book of Judges. 
The simple truth is they just didn't take God's word and uh, apply God's word to their life. And so I want us to go back and I want us to see the instruction, the exhortation that Moses gave to that generation about their responsibility in passing on their faith to their children. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. We'll put it up on the screen. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God... The Lord is one. Let let me just pause, by the way. That is a very, very important, famous passage of Scripture, especially if you come from a Jewish household. That is known as the Shema. The term Shema comes from the first two words of the passage. Hear, O listen, Israel. This passage has been referred to as the Lord's Prayer of the Old Testament. The the Shema is a declaration of faith in one true God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. It talks about the fact that, that, that our God is monotheistic. We don't serve three different gods. We serve one God. We don't believe in polytheism, that there are many gods. We believe that there is only one God. And that God is Jehovah. Jehovah God, who is manifested in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and those three persons are one God. Phenomenal theological verse. Notice once again, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he says this, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your hearts. Notice verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Apart from profound theological truth that is found in these verses, these verses also teach us the responsibility that we as parents have to share our faith with our children. Or in other words, to pass the baton of our faith on to the next generation. So so here's what I wrote in your outline. It's very simply this. Your relationship with Jesus is the most important factor in the discipleship of your kids. Let me say that again. So, so, so important. I know it might seem basic to you, and I know you might be like, okay, Brian, let's bounce over that and let's get to the juicy stuff. Listen, this is the juicy stuff. All right, your relationship with Jesus is the number one most important factor in the discipleship of your kids. I was raised in a a wonderful home by wonderful parents. Sometimes people look at our family and, and they assume that my dad was a pastor. I'm a pastor. My twin brother is a pastor. Our two boys are pastors. Bruce's boy is a pastor. And so I get this question all the time. People come and they say, so Brian, where was your dad a pastor? My dad wasn't a pastor. My dad was a barber. My dad was a barber in the 70s. You know when they had long hair back then? So, so my dad had his own barber shop, had like three barbers that were working for him, and then the long hair fad came in. And it destroyed my dad's business. It really did. My dad had to let off a barber and then let, uh, or let go of a barber, then let go of another barber, then let go of a third barber, and finally it was only him. And I remember him coming home from work at times and telling my mom, I had one customer today. I made six bucks or something like that. So my dad had to leave the barber business and he joined Ashland Oil and became an engineer later on in life. But my dad was just a godly man who loved Jesus, who loves Jesus with all of his heart. 
I would wake up in the morning and I would see my dad with his Bible open and I would see my dad praying. I saw the same consistency in my mom as well. I say all of that to say this, I am who I am today forever, for whatever that's worth, as a man, as a husband, as a dad, as a pastor. I am who I am today because I had parents who not only told me that I should love Jesus, but I have parents who love Jesus with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their might. And they pointed me to Jesus. I'm so grateful for that. Moms and dads, grandpas, I would tell you today, the number one most important factor in your kids becoming disciples of Jesus is your relationship with Jesus. Notice how that truth is conveyed in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Did you notice the personal pronouns that are found? Let me read it again. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's what I put in the outline very simply. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. The simple truth is this. You cannot ask your children to do something. You cannot ask your children to be something that you are not. Kids are so smart in this day and age. They've always been. Kids can see right through hypocrisy. They can see right through it. Kids are smart enough to know that mom and dad are one way at church on Sunday and they're another way at home Monday through Friday. They, they see right through that. They're able to detect whether you're sincere. They're able to detect whether you're real. They're able to detect whether your passion for Jesus is something that you stir up on Sunday morning or is it something that drives you on Monday when you go to work? Is it something that, that drives you and controls who you are as you're in your neighborhood and as you're interacting with, with your neighbors and your friends. Are you real in your life? Kids are able to see that and they're able to detect that. And kids are looking for something that is real. You cannot ask your kids to do or be something that you yourself are not. You must love the Lord if you want them to love the Lord. You must be committed with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your might if you want them to be totally committed. You see, here, here's the first truth, and we can't bounce over it. Your kid's discipleship begins with you. That's where it starts. There's a second truth, though. God's word should be on your heart. Now, notice verse 6. We read it just a few moments ago, and he said, And these words that I command you today shall be on your hearts. In other words, Moses is saying, God's word, what I am communicating to you, God's word in written form, which was the Torah back then, God's word is something that should be ingrained on your mind, but not only ingrained on your mind, it should be something that is ingrained on your hearts. This is a truth that is seen all throughout the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you should meditate on it day and night. Psalm 1, 2, talking about the man who is blessed, but he delights in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So, 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 so here's what he's saying. The idea of having God's word on your heart means to read it. It means to memorize it. It means to meditate upon it. It means to apply it to your life. Man, man this, the, this is basic Christianity 101, but it is not just the pastor's responsibility to know God's word. 
as the leader of your home, as the priest of your home, dads, we believe in the priesthood of the believer. It is your responsibility to know God's Word. It is your responsibility to pass time reading God's Word. It is your responsibility to meditate on it, to memorize it, to apply it to your life, and to guide your family according to the principles of God's Word. Moses says, take these teachings that I have given you and they should be on your heart. So can I ask you a question today? Don't raise your hands. This is just between you and God. Let me ask you a question today. How much of God's Word do you know? How much of God's Word do you know? Have you ever read the Bible? Are there portions of the Bible that you have no idea what they're talking about? How much of God's Word do you know? How much of God's Word do you apply to your life? So it's not just reading it like you sit down and, and read you know, the MSN page on the computer. It's actually taking God's Word and applying it to your life. How much of God's Word can you teach to your kids? That brings us to the second truth. You see, the first truth is this, helping your kids become disciples of Jesus begins with you. The second truth is helping your kids become disciples of Jesus requires consistency. It requires consistency. You say, Brian, what does that mean? What does that mean? Let me, let me say it a couple of ways, very practical today. The first is this, and, and, and please catch this, mom and dads. You cannot delegate discipleship. You can't delegate discipleship. I know we're all about delegation. Uh, uh, I get accused all the time of delegating everything, all right? But discipleship is something that you cannot delegate. Here, here's what I'm afraid that has happened in modern day Christianity. Because our churches have become professionals at having a wonderful children's ministry and we bring in youth pastors who are full-time youth pastors and we pay them thinking it's their job to do all of this. As parents, if we're not careful, we've handed off that responsibility to paid professionals. And we've said, okay, my children's Sunday school teachers, it's their job to teach them the Word of God. Or, or I put my kid in Christian school, and, and, and we love Christian school, but I put my kid in Christian school, and so I'm doing that so there they're going to learn God's Word. Or, or we have a youth director, and it's that youth director's job to, to make sure my teenager is learning God's Word. Listen to me, mom and dads. You cannot delegate discipleship. It's not the children's ministry director's job to make sure that your kids know God's Word. It's not the youth director's job to make sure that your teenager is on the right path. It's your job. It's my job to do that. And I'm afraid as churches, we have, we have delegated that responsibility to someone else. We have paid experts who do that, and that is not my job. Listen, the spiritual training and formation of your family is your responsibility. Dads, listen to me. You have such an awesome responsibility. You are the spiritual leaders of your home. You are the priests of your home. You, along with your wife, are the individuals that God has brought together for the purpose of bringing up these children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I feel today for single moms who are here and have the challenge of having to do that on, the, on their own. I get your heart, but parents, that is our responsibility. We cannot, we must not delegate that responsibility. God has given it to us. So the next truth that we see in the passage is this. How do we do that? You and I must look for opportunities. We must diligently look for opportunities to teach and reinforce the truth of God's word. Notice what he says in verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. In Hebrew, the term diligently is, or, or in Hebrew, the, the phrase, teach them diligently is one word in the Hebrew. It's a word that literally means to sharpen. It, it's a term that was used for the sharpening of arrows. 
That's so poignant because at times whenever we, we, we dedicate children, we read Psalm 127 in verse 4. I was just up in Wisconsin and had the privilege of dedicating little Titus, my grandson, and I read Psalm 127 verse 4 that says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. What does the Bible say? The Bible's saying that you have the opportunity, you have the privilege, you have the responsibility to take that child and diligently train them, to sharpen them, to help them become exactly who God wants them to be. We miss the analogy in our day and age because first of all, we don't use bows and arrows, all right? And secondly, if we use bows and arrows, we go to Bass Pro Shop and we buy one, right? So hardly any of us make our own arrows. But in Old Testament times, they had to what? They had to make their own arrows. And, and, and the quality of the arrow was super important because their life could depend upon it. And God says, just as you take that time and you fabricate those arrows to make sure that they shoot straight, that they go where you want them to go, so your children are arrows in your quiver, and your responsibility, just as a warrior, is to take those arrows and make them. That is your responsibility as a parent. Teach them diligently. Sharpen them, the Old Testament says. So how do you sharpen your kids? You teach them God's word at every opportunity. Moses talks about it in the passage. He says, how do you do that? When do you do that? You do that when you sit in the house. You do that when you're walking in the way. You you do that when you're lying down. You do it when you were rising up. Sit back and say, okay, Brian, what, what does that mean in our culture? In our culture, it means this. You look for every opportunity you possibly can to inculcate the truth of God's Word into the mind and into the hearts of your kids. You say, Brian, when do I do that? We're so busy. You do it when you're driving them to school. You do it when you're watching television. You you do it after they have played with their friends. You do it during a storm. You do it when they go to bed at night. You do it when they wake up in the morning. You look for every opportunity to drill in their mind and in their hearts biblical truths. You say, Brian, what does that look like? How does that look like? Listen, it's it's as simple as this. I'm driving to school. I'm driving them to school in the morning and I'm going east. And I see the sun coming up in the east. And and I tell my kids, hey kids, look how pretty that sun is. Psalm says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. I do that when we're watching something on television and a show brings out a point that goes against our values. And, And we mute the television for just a second. And we say, hey kids, look, let's talk about this for a second because this program is saying this, but you need to know that this goes against God's word. We do it whenever they do something they shouldn't. They get in an argument, they get in a fight with other kids, and we bring them in and we not only punish them, but after we punish them, we sit them down and we take God's word and we show them what they did wrong at that moment. We look for every opportunity we can to teach them God's word. While we're walking, while we're driving, while we're sitting, while we're watching television, while we're at the table, wherever we are, We look for opportunities to teach God's word. You say, Brian, how do I know if it's going to sink in? You don't. But then you take all of that work that you invest in the lives of those kids, and you get on your knees before God, and you begin to pray that the truth of God's word would penetrate their mind, would penetrate their hearts, and it would shape in them into who God wants them to be. If you know anything about sports, so they talk about muscle memory. 
So, so muscle memory, whether you're, whether you're playing baseball or whether you're shooting a basketball, talk about muscle memory. So muscle memory is this. A basketball player takes that basketball and he shoots a shot over and over and over and over and over hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of times. He makes the same motion over and over and over until the way that those muscles work and the way he shoots becomes something that those muscles are used to. And there is a muscle memory so much so that the next time he grabs the basketball, he doesn't even have to think about it. When he grabs the baseball bat, he doesn't have to think about it because his muscles are already toned. They're already prepared. They've done it thousands of times. They know exactly what to do. So, Brian, how does that apply to our kids? Here's what you want to do. You want to ingrain God's word in your kid's mind and heart over and 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 over again. So all of a sudden, your child isn't at home. They're away from home, and all of a sudden, they're presented with a situation. And how do they respond to that situation? They've already been spiritually trained. Their mind and their heart is already spiritually trained by God's Word, and they naturally respond with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit how they are supposed to respond. Why is that? Because mom and dad's been in the spiritual batting cage, and mom and dad has been on the basketball court, the spiritual batting basketball court over and over and over and over again, drilling the truth of God's word into our kids. That's what Moses is saying. Look for every opportunity you can to teach them. And I would add this, it's not foolproof. Man, I don't want you to think that it's foolproof that if you do this, you're guaranteed that your kids are going to do this. It's not foolproof. Man, I know some tremendous parents who have done the best that they could and their kids went a direction that they shouldn't go. And I know parents that were terrible parents and God was gracious to them and their kids are loving the Lord. But I'm I'm telling you this, the truth of God's word is there. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. What is the truth? Consistency. Being consistent. Moms and dads, you, 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 you've got to be consistent. You've got to be, you've got to form those spiritual habits in the lives of your kids. That's why church attendance is so important. That's why devotions are so important. That's why praying is so important. Those are spiritual habits that you are driving into the mind and the heart of those kids that are, that are going to form them into who God wants them to be. Does that make sense, church? Does it make sense? Verse 8 says, And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You say, Brian, what, what is that all about? Well, during Old Testament times, they didn't have a complete Bible like you and I have today. Today we have the privilege of having a complete Bible. If we don't have it on, uh, uh, like this, we have it like this. <laughs> we don't have it like this. We have it on our phones. I mean, I have on my phone probably 150 different versions of the Bible. We have all of that at our fingertips. During Old Testament times, they didn't have a complete Bible at their fingertips. The synagogue, the temple, the tabernacle had the complete Torah, but they didn't have a complete Torah. They couldn't go down to the corner Bible bookstore and buy a complete Torah. So what did they do? God says, here's what you do. I want you to take little strips of paper and I want you to write out phrases that teach the truth of God's word. And I want you to put it on their forehead. And I want you to put it on their hands. And I want them to see God's word over and over and over and over and over again. The truth is not to wear God's word. That's not the truth that is being conveyed. The truth is being conveyed is not to wear it, but to remember it, to know it and to remember it. The more consistent you are in teaching God's word, the spiritual truth will be ingrained in the mind and in the heart of your child. Consistency. So very important. There's a third thing, and my time's done. Helping your kids become disciples of Jesus means to frequently remind them of God's power and God's blessings. Let me show you some verses. We don't have time to read the whole chapter, but let me read just a few verses out of the chapter. If we continued going in verse 10, 
Moses said this, and when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give you, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and he gives you houses full of things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. In other words, here's what Moses is saying. When God brings you into the promised land and he blesses you unbelievably, and he gives you more than you need, more than you could ever ask for, when God blesses you, notice what he says in verse 12, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can I, can I put a 2019 version in that? So when God gives you three cars, and when God gives you a refrigerator in which there's food and all there's always in it, and God gives you a house in which the air conditioner is running and you're always cool, and God gives the ability to put your kids in a good school and they have a good education, and you're able to take vacations and go places that other people in the world only dream about going, and you experience the goodness and the blessing of God, be careful that you do not forget God. You know what's happening in our country, and we can talk about all the political stuff that's going on, and I'm not going there. Here's what's happening in our country. We've been blessed by God, but we have forgotten where our blessings have come from. And we take credit. We, we think we're self-sufficient. We think we can do it on our own. We might in our mind think that we need God, but in our heart of hearts, we don't think that we need God because we can make it on our own. We don't desperately need Him. We don't view ourselves as broken before a holy God. And so we live our lives, yes, believing that He's there, and yes, calling ourselves a Christian and Christian nation, but practically speaking, God is not a part of our everyday lives. We go to church on Sunday, we know how to do what we need to do, but God is not a part of our lives 24-7. We've taken the good things from God, and we've forgotten where they have come from. And we're just as guilty as the children of Israel, and we've forgotten. And so what was important to us is not important to our kids. And if we're not careful, it's going to be less important to our grandkids. And it's going to be less important to our great-grandkids. What should we do? Jump down to verse 20. And when your son comes to you in time and asks, Daddy, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has given to us? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord showed us signs and wonders and grievous, great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all of his household before your eyes. Here's what Moses said. So when your kids come and say, Dad, I don't get it. How come the Torah is just filled with all kinds of rules that I don't like? How come God wants me to live in a way that's different than the way everybody else lives? What's going on there? How come God is that way? And God says, here's what you do. You look at your kids and you remind them where you came from. And you tell your kids that you were slaves in Egypt until God in his grace and in his mercy reached down and rescued you from Egypt and took you to the promised land where you are today. You remind them of the great things that God has done. One of the best things that you and I can do for our kids is to constantly remind them what has God done in our life as a family? How has God provided for us? How has God protected us? What has God done in our lives? And I remind my kids over and over and over again why. I don't want them to forget that we serve an all-powerful God. I don't want them to forget 
that God rescued me. I don't want them to forget that I was a slave in sin. And it was God in His grace and mercy who came alongside of me and rescued me. And I am who I am today. We are who we are as a family today. Not because I'm smart. Not because I'm educated. Not because I'm an American. Not because I've done this. I am who I am today by the grace and the power of God. Our kids need to hear that over and over and over again. Man, it'll wipe away that sense of entitlement when all of a sudden they realize that they are nothing more than sinners saved by grace. And just as mommy and daddy desperately needed Jesus, they desperately need Jesus in their lives. That's what we need to do. So today, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, you have a baton in your hand today. What are you going to do with that baton? Are you going to drop it? Are you going to allow it to fall? Are you, with God's grace and God's power and God's enablement, going to reach out by faith and pass that baton on to your kids and pray and trust God to take the truth of God's word to accomplish in the lives of your kids what only he can accomplish? The simple truth is this, you can never be a good enough parent, and I can never be a good enough parent. We desperately need Jesus. And when we reach that place in our lives, that's when we begin to point our kids in the right direction.